All right, so this video is about hooking up a Motorola Razor to an Arduino. Um, and what we're gonna be doing with it basically is using the buttons on the Razor as an input to the Arduino so we can control what's going on in the Arduino. And I'm gonna demonstrate this thing, I'm gonna show how it works and just kind of give you a general idea of how you can use this. All right, so um, uh, this project is taking advantage of what's called uh, dual tone multi-frequency signaling, um, otherwise known as DTMF. So basically what that is, um, if you have, you know, ever used like a regular landline phone or like an older cell phone, you know, when you push the buttons, you hear those little beeping sounds. And if you've paid attention, you've noticed that each button has a slightly different sound to it. Well, that's because those sounds are actually encoded tones. Like it's a, it's a code that tells you which button is being pushed. So like when you're using a landline phone, um, when you push the button and it makes that little beep, it actually sends that down the phone line to the phone company, and then they decode that beep to know which button you pushed so they know which number to dial. So um, we can use those tones uh, for lots of different stuff. I mean, it's basically just a way of storing information and sending a signal. And we can use a razor like this. So basically all we have to do is we have to be able to get those signals out of the razor and get them into the Arduino and then, you know, process it from there. So before I get into that, first I got to show you something on this razor. So if we look around, you'll notice that there's no headphone jack, right? So like there's no headphone jack anywhere. So normally on a phone with a headphone jack, when you push the buttons, you could get the tones out that way. Now notice we do have a USB port. This is the charging port, right? So there's a way around this. So uh, Motorola made these little um, headsets as an accessory. Sorry, I'm kind of fooling around with it here. They've, um, it has a USB port, um, an earbud, a little microphone, and so this was an accessory they sold, right? And so what happens is um, if, if I plug this USB, uh, USB cable into the razor and I push the buttons, I can hear the beeps coming in through the earbud, right? So basically this gives me a way to tap into the signals, right? So basically what you have to do is you have to like snip this off and access the wires. And actually I've done that already. On a, um, on a separate headset. And I've got it hooked up right here. So here's my, basically what I did was I, um, I made a little headphone jack for it. Like it's a headphone jack adapter basically. And this allows me to um, get those audio tones out of the razor so that I can um, send the signals to my circuit. So all I do is I just plug it in here. Okay. And just a quick demonstration. Um, I'm just gonna push some buttons really quick and watch the LEDs. See there, you got a flash there. So what's happening here is um, when I push these buttons, um, it's, it's sending down that, that um, DTMF audio tone into the circuit and it's converting that into a four bit binary code. And each key has its own binary code associated with it. Okay, and so to do that, um, I'm actually using a chip called a, um, a DTMF receiver or a DTMF decoder, whatever you want to call it. And the, um, the part number for the chip is MT8870. So I'm actually going to pull that up on my laptop really quick. I'm going to have to... Oh, by the way, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. There's a, a Wikipedia page on um, dual tone multi-frequency signaling. So let, let's talk about this really quick before I get into the, um, the setup on the circuit a little more. So basically this webpage just describes in detail what DTMF is all about. And there's a little table here. I'm gonna move the phone off the tripod really quick. There's a table that shows the combination of frequencies that each button push uses. So notice, you know, um, most phones don't use that fourth column, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, so we eliminate that, and we just use um, the first three columns of numbers. That Those correspond to the buttons in our keypads, and those frequencies you see on the sides 
are the tones that are used for those for those uh, button pushes. So if you want to learn more about DTMF, I suggest just looking up the Wikipedia page. Um, it'll tell you all about it. All right, so dual tone multi-frequency signaling. All right, so I gotta put my phone back on my tripod here. Okay. So anyways, um, the chip we're, we're using to decode these tones is called a, a DTMF receiver. And the part number is MT8870. And that's actually, that's actually this little chip right in here. So what this chip does is it, it reads in those audio tones and it decodes them and converts them into that four bit binary code. So it's kind of like, like an analog to digital converter, right? Because it's taking those analog tones and it's converting it to digital, in this case, that four bit code. All right, and so to know how to use that chip, you gotta look up the data sheet. So um, if you're new to electronics, um, something you should really learn how to do is read a data sheet. Okay, so I'm gonna pull up that data sheet really quick. Sorry, this thing isn't focusing very well. Here we go. This is the data sheet for the DTMF receiver. So there's our part number, MT8870. And I think I'm gonna, I think I'll provide a link to this in the um, the video description. But what this what this data sheet does, I mean, if if you're if you've never read a data sheet before, I mean, if you're really if you're experienced with electronics, you already know all about all this stuff. But um, for those who are not experienced, anytime you're dealing with these integrated circuits, you got to look up the data sheet so you understand how everything works. So basically, this gives a description of the architecture of the chip, right? It, um, it shows you what all the pins do, right? It gives a description of everything. It, it gives kind of a theory of how the whole chip works. And it also gives you like examples of applications. So I'm gonna scroll down all the way here and it shows an example of an application circuit that you can use. And it's actually the same circuit that I used. I'm just gotta find it really quick. Here we go. So this circuit is basically everything you need to take that analog tone and convert it into that digital binary code. And they even give you, you know, the resistor values, capacitor values you should use for this. So I'm gonna briefly explain what's going on here. So if you look at the uh, top left corner DTMF input, so that is the, um, that's the input um, from the audio from the razor. So that's that headset I showed you um, where you're gonna you're gonna have to cut the wire and um, separate the wires out. So basically DTMF input, that's gonna be that main signal wire. And the other wire is basically the wire, it's the metal shielding to the wire, which is gonna be connected to the ground on this circuit. So it's really only two connections. The DTMF input, which is the main wire on your headset coming, which would normally go to the earbud. And then of course the shielding on that headset, which goes to ground. And you can see that's just a small little, it's just a basic amplifier circuit. Um, and R1 and R2 control the gain. Um, if we go, so that, that gets your analog signal in. If you go down to the lower X1, um, that's your crystal oscillator. And that is at a frequency of 3.579 megahertz. Uh, what that does is that provides the reference frequency that the chip uses to decode the audio tones. Um, so that is essential. You you need that to make everything work. So on my circuit down here, this little silver can looking thing, that's the crystal oscillator. And something they don't show in the circuit diagram, but it's really important, are these um, two little capacitors I have here. Those are load capacitors. Um, when you buy a crystal oscillator, you have to, usually it specifies the load capacitance, and you need to get capacitors that match those values to... Um, to connect up. And you know, they don't show that in the circuit diagram, but it's really care it's really important. So you would have a two capacitors, one connected from oscillator two to ground, and the other one from oscillator one to ground. And um, something important to consider is that if you look at the current flow through the crystal oscillator into one capacitor and then to the other, like imagine if the the current is flowing um, is flowing clockwise. Actually, I'll go back to the circuit here to on the breadboard will make more sense. So imagine you have um, clockwise flow of current through the crystal oscillator into the right capacitor, then into ground, then into the left capacitor. 
and then back into the oscillator. Well, since both capacitors are connected to ground, the current flows through the capacitors in series, right? And so if you have two identical capacitors in series, the total capacitance is one half. So in this case, this crystal oscillator has a load capacitance of like 18 picofarads. That means I need to connect two 36 picofarad capacitors. And that's what I've done. And that gives you the proper load capacitance and gets a good oscillation. Okay, so going back over here really quick. Now let's look at the top right. Notice we have C2 and R3. Um, that RC circuit determines how long the tone, the audio tone, um, needs to be present before the chip decodes it and registers the value. So this is kind of like done for debouncing. Um, so basically when the capacitor charges up, it will, um, uh, it will, the chip will basically register the tone and send the code to the, um, the outputs. And so now let's go to the bottom right. You see um, STD um, and Q1 through Q4. Okay, so Q1 through Q4, that's, those are your outputs with your binary code, right? So that, that's just the digital data. But the STD pin is really important because that becomes active once the chip recognizes and registers um, the tone, right? So basically when you're, when you're using your Arduino to monitor this chip, you need to monitor that STD pin. And so basically when that goes high, logic high, that indicates that uh, that data is available to read, right? So your circuit or your Arduino that is needs to monitor that STD pin, all right? So anyways, I just thought it was important to point this out because um, a lot of this project is, you know, getting the circuit right. And fortunately in the data sheet, they give you a really nice example here of how to get everything working. So, um, yeah, so I think that's pretty much it for the circuit. Let's go, maybe I should um, go back and to this, the actual real life circuit. And also I'm gonna show you the um, demonstration with Arduino now, because I've got everything all set up. So basically what I've got here is I'm gonna pick up the razor really quick. Um, so I, I, when I'm pushing the buttons, I'm also displaying them to the serial monitor. Let's see if I can get this to work. So, whoops. It does this weird thing where sometimes it doesn't pick up the first button push. There we go. So it's reading those in. I programmed it so when I push pound, it goes to the next line. So I'm going to delete these really quick. And let's do nine. All right, so yeah, you can see that. Like by um, pushing the buttons, I'm able to read them in and um, the Arduino reads all that and sends it to the serial monitor. So yeah, I'm effectively, um, I have my razor connected up to the Arduino and it's reading the codes, right? So, you know, you can see the serial monitor here, but you don't actually have the, um, the code. Let me find the code really quick. Here we go. All right, so brief description of the code. I mean, it's, it's super, super simple. I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm kind of too lazy to post this online, so I'll just kind of scroll through it here. Um, first thing I do is I just define the pins for measuring, well, for monitoring STD and Q1 through Q4. And then I define some variables. And then in the setup section, I define all those pins as inputs and I begin the serial monitor. Then inside the loop, the first step is we take two samples on the STD pin with a short delay. And then if the first one is low and the second one is high, that means we have a rising edge, which means the pin, the STD pin turned on and data is available. So now what we do after that, we have a short delay for debouncing, and then we read the four pins to get the code. Then it goes into a big if-else structure. And so, for example, if 
Q1 is high and all the other ones are low, that's number one. And if Q2 is high and all the other ones are low, that's Q2. Oh, excuse me, that's um, number two that we display. So basically it's just decoding that, um, that binary code, right? So um, if we push button number three, you get Q1 high, Q2 high, and Q3 and Q4 low. That's just binary for three, right? And then if we have, um, if we have number four, right, Q3 is high and everything else is low. So that's just the binary code for four. And so you just continue on that pattern for each of the buttons. Um, one thing I got to point out is that um, when you push button zero, that's actually code 10. So notice we have Q4 high and Q2 high. That's A plus 2 is 10, right? And then 11 is the star key and 12 is the pound key. And that's also where I go to the next line. And that's literally the entire Arduino program right there. It's pretty simple. Um, it's just basically a loop with an if else statement inside. Like that's actually it's an, an if else structure inside of a different if statement. And then at the bottom, I have two null else statements where I, I mean, I'm just completing the if else structure, but there's nothing really happening there. So um, that's pretty much it. So yeah, this, this is pretty neat. Um, it allows you to, you know, use the razor in electronics projects, you know, if you're into that kind of thing. So yeah, it's pretty fun. Like, I mean, like I already demonstrated it once, but I guess I can just do it again. Right. Whoops. So something weird I've noticed, I don't know if it's just this razor, if all of them do it. When I first flip open the screen, it doesn't recognize the first button push, but then after the second one, whoops, what are you doing there? There we go. After the second one, it starts to work. So it's just a slightly buggy, but for the most part, works just fine. See that? Yeah, that works great. So yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um. I should probably discuss, um, if you try this yourself, what are the most likely things to fail? Um, the first thing, like if you, if you put all this together according to the circuit and the data sheet and it doesn't work, um, I would first recommend obviously checking to make sure your audio signal comes in, right? So here's my, here's my audio input that's coming from the Razer headset that I modified. Uh, make sure your audio signal's coming in. Um, if you have an oscilloscope, that would be a great use for it. Also, make sure your crystal oscillator is oscillating. Like, if if your crystal oscillator isn't going, then nothing's going to work. And they can be pretty finicky. So, if you, if you put all this together and you're having trouble, check your crystal oscillator on an oscilloscope. And make sure that's going. And make sure you have the right load capacitance. Um, and if that still doesn't work... Um, you might have to look into a different option for your oscillator. I mean, you need that right frequency at um, 3.579 megahertz, but um, there are um, some good articles online on crystal oscillator circuits. And I've had to look up myself to learn more about um, oscillators and because sometimes they're just really stubborn and you got to kind of dig a little deeper to get them going. Uh, one other thing I have on the circuit that I didn't really discuss is this... Um, so, I mean, I already talked about this chip, which is the DTMF decoder, but I also have this little, um, this little bus driver here. It's just to buffer the, um, the LEDs from the inputs on the Arduino. Uh, what you don't want to do is connect the LEDs to the Arduino inputs, because what's going to happen is if you have a small leakage current going through those LEDs, um, even if it's just a tiny current and it, um, it, the LED is dark, it's not on, that tiny leakage current can cause the LED to forward bias, which will cause a voltage that prevents your um, GPI, GPIO ports on your Arduino from going to logic zero. So even when the LEDs are all dark, they, if there's a little tiny leakage current, um, the Arduino GPIO, GPIO ports will read logic one, and that is not good, right? So basically what happens is this buffer chip allows me to isolate the LEDs from the Arduino GPIO inputs. And I'll give you the data sheet for that really quick. 
So I've already got that one pulled up too. That is, I just used this buffer chip um, LS245 um, octal bus transceiver with three state outputs. So base, it's a very common um, bus driver chip. And you know, you just look at the data sheet, it'll tell you everything about how it works. So yeah, I just use that to isolate the Arduino from the LEDs. I mean, if you're not using LEDs on your inputs, then you can just get rid of this chip altogether and just use the, um, the DTMF receiver chip into your Arduino. And I should also comment, um, you know, you don't have to use this with an Arduino. Like you can use pretty much any microcontroller or microprocessor or whatever you feel like. I mean, you don't even have to like use a, you don't even have to write any code if you want to like um, input it straight into some TTL logic circuit. I mean, that would work too, right? But I mean, I'm just using an Arduino for this particular demonstration just because that's like what everybody else is using. But don't think that's the only thing that'll work. Like I'm actually doing this exact same application with my Z80 computer and it's working great. So don't think it's just for Arduino. Like you can use this um, for, you know, lots of different microcontroller projects. Also, I mean, this setup here, it's really just the beginning, right? Like, I mean, all I'm doing is like, this is really simple. I'm just, you know, reading button pushes from the razor, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I'm just reading the button pushes, right? Just let me show you that. But I mean, like once you've got the data into the Arduino, I mean, kind of, it's kind of like the sky's the limit, right? I mean, you, you can write whatever kind of code you want to do, you know, any number of crazy applications. Like, I don't know, maybe you could make it so you could like, you know, T9 emails and connect to the internet or let's see, what else could you do? You could make, you could turn the razor into like a video game controller or something where you're pushing the buttons on the keypad. Like there's, I mean, there's any number of things you could do. It's just kind of like, as long as you're creative enough and you have the ideas and the willingness to try, I mean, you can do all kinds of stuff. It's not like it only, you know, just displays numbers on the screen and flashes LEDs. So this is, I just kind of wanted to show you like an application for using a razor, you know, and, and this is especially going to be um, relevant when they shut down the 2G network and you can't use these things anymore. Like, it's not, you know, totally a brick, right? I mean, you could, you can use this thing for other projects, just to have fun with it, even if you can't use it as a phone. Um, one other thing I should mention is that, you know, it's not just a razor that would work for this application. Pretty much any phone that can send out the DTMF uh, tones will work just fine, right? It doesn't have to be a razor. It could be any old phone with a headphone jack or even a smartphone with a headphone jack if if you want to use that, as long as you can configure it to send the tones out, it should work just fine. I mean, I'm just using the Razer because obviously that's my favorite phone and that's the one I love playing around with. So, um, anyways, I think I'm going to wrap that up. Um, that pretty much covers everything. Everything that I wanted to uh, demonstrate in this video, at least. All right. Thanks for watching.